when it comes to aliens, uh, there's some things I just can't tell you. But what what is true, uh, and I'm, I'm actually being serious here, is is that uh, there are uh, there's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. Now, I know what you've seen is what those Navy pilots saw in 2004. We saw this little white, tic-tac-looking object. And there have been some 300 sightings since then, and their radars locked onto it. Usually we have multiple sensors that are picking up these things. There are things flying around up there that we haven't fully identified yet. We're 99% sure it's not foreign adversarial technology, so that only leaves really one one other option is there something else that we simply do not understand that might come extraterrestrially that uh, some might uh, say uh, constitutes a, a a different form of life oh my god it's flying so fast sometimes things seem extraordinary but in reality there's actually a pretty ordinary explanation this is not one of those things. There are key characteristics that, if observed, make a sighting extraordinary. These five observables, outlined by the former head of the ATIP program at the U.S. Pentagon, separate the ordinary from the extraordinary, because with our current understanding of physics, these maneuvers shouldn't even be possible. So where's the evidence of this in flying Tic Tacs? This is Catalina Island, and right here on April 15, 1966, we got some evidence. A photographer for the United States Navy, Lee Hansen, filmed what appears to be a flying tic-tac-shaped object. And it was an ideal day for aerial photography, and it appeared silver with a shadow underneath, as always metallic. However, an episode of Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World seemed to debunk the film. Every frame is scanned and turned into numbers by Dr. Robert Nathan top expert in the computer enhancement of photographs. His object is to get the clearest possible picture by averaging the best frames of the film. I'm going to take the picture and start adding it to the next picture. The third photograph has been brought in. This picture shows the average of all of these three. And now you begin to see a, uh, an appearance of a uh, strong white image on the top and there seems to be some holes or some kind of transparency underneath here. This begins to look like a small commercial airplane. Well, I've looked at this film quite a few times and I'm convinced that it was a small private plane. There's no need to look any further for an explanation. Our reasons not to look further include stacking analysis with 1970s equipment, and Arthur looked at it several times. But let's look at it several times with modern image analysis. When clarifying film, we don't necessarily want to land on a single stacked frame to determine our object. Anything from basic denoising to AI software that learns from the picture itself can give us a clearer look a much more expansive set of data from which to observe the object, which appears to be exactly what the Navy photographer described. No wings, no rotors, no sign of propulsion. But you don't need to travel very far to further the case of anti-gravity Tic Tacs. In 2004, Navy pilots spotted and recorded a Tic Tac-shaped UFO with infrared cameras on their planes. But the witnesses weren't the only corroboration to the video. These fighter jets include a situational awareness page with a data link system, which collects data from not only their camera, but from multiple sources, including radar, to confirm detection with data from all sources available. This compilation data revealed no discrepancies with itself and no discrepancy from what they were witnessing with their eyes. A flying tic-tac that not only displayed anti-gravity, but three other observables that categorized the event as extraordinary. At this point, the sighting is confirmed by the most qualified witnesses and the most qualified machinery. But what if this event can be explained by our own tech being tested in a secret program? If this were true, we'd have to accept that not only would it be interfering with our own operations, carrying its own classified information, and against the knowledge of the Navy, 
but also committing acts of war against ourselves. According to the Geneva Convention, the radar jamming of the fighter pilots exhibited by the Tic Tac UFO is enough to qualify. With publicly available research, it'd be nothing short of science fiction to say that we can operate this technology today, an even bigger stretch back in 2004. So what if something happened all the way back in 1964? On April 24th, witnesses in the town of Socorro, New Mexico spotted a flying Tic Tac. The most notable witness was one Lonnie Zamora, a police officer who pulled over to investigate where it landed. What he experienced was later modeled to visually indicate the scene, where Zamora saw the tic-tac-shaped object others had witnessed and what appeared to be its legs. Interesting to note that further reports of the 2004 incident specified a similar leg feature as well that may be further evidenced by the unreleased, high-quality footage of the incident. In Zamora's case, four metallic bars supposedly extended from the tic-tac, holding it up by permeating the ground beneath. The object took off with a blue flame underneath. It halted mid-air, then instantly accelerated away, exhibiting hypersonic velocity and perhaps more significantly, trace evidence. Collected from the scene was metal debris lodged in a rock from one of the legs, determined to be chiefly comprised of advanced silica compounds, but we'll get back to trace evidence of the Socorro sighting soon. The next morning, about 80 miles southeast, a man named J.D. Hatch reported a bright oval-shaped object craft land behind Round Mountain. At 10.30 p.m., two motorists driving down Highway 84 reported a strange flying object come straight toward their car and then veer away. All they could see, they told police, was a jet stream of blue flame underneath, one of several recurring features matching the Socorro incident. Two hours later, about 20 miles north of Highway 84, a man named Orlando Gallego spotted a metallic object on the ground with nearly identical attributes of the Socorro case, including indentations on the ground, their measurements, distance and depth, burn marks from the alleged blue flame, and odd footprints. The similarities between the Galagos and Zamora UFO were striking, but the footprints add the strangest bit yet. In the Socorro case, Officer Zamora saw two beings the size of children outside the craft. In both cases, the footprints were originally described as similar to feline animals in the area, but offered signs of a manufactured material as well, ultimately too rotund to definitively categorize them. The next day, one George Metropolis was driving about a mile south of the Highway 85 and 90 junction when he saw a silver-looking object go up over a mountain and down. It was described with matching dimension estimations and a glow underneath like exhaust flames. On April 28th, at 5.30 p.m., Mr. and Mrs. Napoleon Green were driving 17 miles north of Socorro on Highway 85 when they observed two egg-shaped objects moving across the sky. They reflected sunlight in accordance with their unwinged surface, and the dimension estimates matched as well. A year later, an incident nearly mirroring the Socorro case took place in a lavender field in Valençol, France, including the sighting of two child-sized beings. The credibility of the witnesses in these cases were heavily co-signed by their respective authorities. But what happens when the authorities themselves become the witnesses? 1964 not only brought us trace evidence in a sea of reliable witness reports, but also military reports with radar evidence. The Project Mission reporter at Holloman Air Force Base, Coral Lorenzen, reported some of the events that took place in the same time frame. Just before the Zamora incident, multiple unidentified lights were seen on the White Sands Missile Range. Then, on April 30th, a B-57 pilot radioed headquarters as he looked down on a white, egg-shaped object landing on the desert. The object was picked up on radar and its track automatically recorded and obtained by the Air Force Base. Then, on May 15th, around midnight, the stallion site tracked two objects on radar as they hovered over the range north of the station. One of the trained radar operators observed them visually, describing them as football-shaped. The objects flew at a low altitude side by side, making sporadic maneuvers, separating and then rejoining each other. A tracking signal was sent from the station to one of the objects, at which point, 
a significant piece of human history is made. The UFOs alternated a response with a standard FAA recognition code. This is like texting an alien. What are you doing? And it just responds. This is a documented case of the military having a language exchange with an unidentified flying object. They knew the language, yet these objects remain unidentified. On May 22nd, radar again tracked a UFO within just two miles of the station. Then, a second radar track of a UFO gets captured in the same day. Holloman Air Force Base later confirmed to the press that their radar units had indeed tracked two UFOs on the range that day. But our most trained observers haven't just confirmed sightings either. They've confirmed the effects. This is CNN Breaking News. The breaking news involves a power failure that shut down a major part of the U.S. nuclear missile arsenal. Let's go to our Pentagon correspondent, Chris Lawrence. Wow, Chris, what, what do we know? Well, Wolf, this happened out in Warren Air Force Base out in Wyoming. And, and bottom line is this. For less than an hour, about an hour on Saturday, uh, the base lost primary communication with about 50 intercontinental ballistic missiles. Although widespread media coverage of the incident contained no hint of any UFO reports, a subsequent investigation yielded intriguing information about a series of still unexplained sightings occurring during the communications disruption. Various missile maintenance teams responding to the problem reported observing a huge cigar-shaped object maneuvering in the sky above the missile field. According to Hastings sources, the entire missile maintenance squadron was sternly admonished by its commander not to talk to journalists or researchers about, quote, the things they may or may not have seen in the sky. This wouldn't be the only case of military members speaking out, only to be anonymized or taken out of the picture. The human element, after all, perhaps is the most frightening. It takes on a scarier tone in public consciousness when it appears that our trained protectors are being affected by something unknown. In Mansfield, Ohio, multiple witnesses saw a bright object appear in the sky, and it quickly approached an Army Reserve helicopter. The crew reported a 60-foot-long, cigar-shaped object with a bright green light. When they attempted to descend to avoid it, the craft reportedly pulled them upward from 1,700 feet to 3,700 feet. The pilot, Lawrence Coyne, observed the object up close. It was almost a mid-air collision with an object that we, or you know, as a UFO. We did not know it was such until it was on top of the helicopter. Lieutenant Colonel Coyne felt so strongly about his UFO experience that he became part of a delegation to the United Nations that tried to encourage the UN to deal with the subject of UFOs. At the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., seven former Air Force officers once stationed at nuclear bases around the country said that not only have UFOs visited Air Force bases, but some have succeeded in disabling nuclear missiles at their station. Former Air Force Captain Robert Salas oversaw 10 nuclear missiles at Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana when a UFO took them offline in 1967. An above-ground guard radioed Captain Salas as it was happening, reporting a, quote, pulsating oval-shaped object. It's about 30 feet in diameter and just hovering above the front gate. Right then, Captain Salas noticed that the missiles started going offline. They were essentially disabled while this object was overhead. One would think that with the credibility of these cases and over a hundred declassified documents describing military encounters with UFOs, the public would be able to provide ample evidence of UFO sightings as well. But the improvement of technology is a double-edged sword. The videos may be better, but so are the fakes. This lends more credence to older cases and their corroborating evidence. It's a pattern in history that can be traced to the oldest documentations of flaming Roman shields spotted over historic battles, or biblical references of flying rolls spotted in the sky, measuring with odd specification its similarity to contemporary sightings. There's no CGI in 1966, no pseudo-metallic silicate crafts that humans could land and take off from various fields in 1964. Which brings us back to the five observables. What makes a UFO sighting extraordinary is hard to capture by virtue of the very thing that makes it extraordinary. It's hard to observe, which pits modern evidence in a difficult valley of human history. We've grown so advanced in our ability to observe, but just as far in our ability to fake 
or mistake an observation. We've advanced our technology and understanding, but not enough to come to a resounding conclusion about what these flying Tic Tacs are. But if our current collection of the evidence gathered through the history of our species shows us one thing for certain, they're real. Uh-oh, where do you think you're going? And wow, look at that. All the way from around here to up here, and even back here. There it is, there's the flat alien footprints, baby.